Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I admit that that scripture, when I first looked at it and I thought, well, there's a nice little story. But I'm learning there's always more than meets the eye. There's depths to things and things to see and insights. And I just have to say I just want to share what I see. Okay? I hope it's helpful. We did have a very interesting meeting here yesterday, as Jillian said, on a transition workshop. It was a little uncomfortable. It was a little challenging. And that's what God does to us, doesn't he? He gets us a little uncomfortable. He challenges us a bit. I think that's what we'll see in the scripture, too. There's a little bit of discomfort and a bit of challenge there. We have that workshop. We look at things. We wonder, what is God doing here? What is he doing with us? Okay. Things are different. We're not really the same congregation we were. We're something new, and we haven't totally figured that out. We're working on it. But who's leading? Who knows where we're going? Who has in mind what he's doing? Ah, that's what we need to tune into. So we'll take a look at this and comment on it and uh, see what we can gather, see what we learn. Starts out, it says, as soon as they left the synagogue. Well, that's a place to stop right there. <laughs> you know, these people were keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Some of you have done that too. After church, what do you do? Go to nothing. There's nothing to do but two things. Eat and talk. Right? Now, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and he had just done in a magnificent demonstration of healing in that synagogue service, and he had astonished people with his teaching and authority. He didn't quote people, say, you know, I have this opinion here, and to quote this theologian, you see how I agree. No, he spoke with authority. He just knew, and they were kind of astonished. He doesn't have to build any credibility. He is credibility, <laughs> right? So they were all kind of doing it. So after church, guess what? Everybody was probably having things to talk about, things to chat about. And they went different places. It was the Sabbath, okay? So they went somewhere. So Peter says, probably, I'm reading in this a little bit, but just think along with his new boss, right? <laughs> He's going to take his new boss to his house, okay? Because his mother-in-law is a great cook. She's got some things already set up and ready for us for the Sabbath. So they go over there to talk and eat. It wasn't very far, of course. And they get there, and what do they find? Now, you might say, well, he took him there because he knew his mother-in-law was sick. Well, maybe. But it's kind of interesting here, and I read through some of the commentaries, there's different opinions about this situation. Maybe they didn't know she was sick. Oh, you read it and see what you think. But it says she was in bed with a fever, and some of the, some of the commentaries say she, this was not just, oh, I feel hot. No, <laughs> she was really sick is what they're getting out of this. And they go in, and she must be in a different room. <laughs> Where is she? Mom, Mama, Mama, they're here. She, she can't help them. And they go in and find her, and she is really sick. And then there's a little panic that sets in. Right? So what do they do? It says, and right away they went and told him about her. Now, again, I'm kind of projecting a little bit as to what that situation might be, have gone on, but I just want to open our thinking to realize there's a lot more going on here, and maybe someday we can ask some questions and find out the rest of the details. But we can be curious. And they told him about her, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her. Well, a healing. On the Sabbath. <laughs> Did you notice that? I never saw that before until I read it this time. He healed her on the Sabbath day. Well, of course, we know he goes around and he does that, right? But this is the beginning of his ministry. And here's just with this very small group that Mark was very particular about recording, Simon and Andrew and James and John. Okay? And he healed her. Why? And she began to serve them. In other words, there was a purpose to that healing. And it wasn't just that he wanted someone to serve him. Or wanted to, No, no. He was demonstrating that his intervention in life is for a purpose. 
His intervention in her life is so that she can do something, so that she can serve, so that she's needed, that she's part of things. And how often do have we seen that in our own lives, different times? He's intervened, he's helped us, he's comforted us, he's brought us through trials. Why? For a purpose. <laughs> And that purpose may be different in different circumstances. But it's real clear here that mom had a purpose. <laughs> now, did that solve all her problems? Did she live the rest of her life without ever, ever getting a fever again? I don't think so. You know, was she ever late to a meeting? Did she ever miss church again? Yeah, you know, <laughs> she was a person, right? Be a lovely lady to talk to. She probably is a really good cook. Eh? But she went on to live a life. But for this moment, she had a purpose in the Lord's hand. As he took her in his hand, he brought her forth for a purpose. His hand is for a purpose for us. What is God doing here? <laughs> you know? One of the things we discussed a little bit in that workshop yesterday is there's all these beautiful homes. Fairly nice places and so forth. But guess what? They're normal people. We don't know, but there's strife behind some of those doors. There's sibling problems. There's financial issues. There's marriage problems. We might not know all the details. Does God? Does he care? Where's his heart? And as he gives us his heart, do we care? Of course. So anyway, isn't that lovely? We've only looked at three verses. <laughs> now look what happens. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. In other words, after the Sabbath, now they could come out. Right? Okay, now we can get back. To, oh, we better take our, our sick and ill and our, you know, upset people and all these emotional problems and so forth. We go over there. And they all came. The whole city was around the door. Wow. Word had spread. Because indeed, they had problems too. They were a broken people in a broken society. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. So he cared, and he healed, and he gave. Why? There must have been a purpose in that too. Yes, it helped people. Yes, that was really good. But more than that, he didn't let the demons go say much or whatever. But he let those miracles speak loudly in the lives of those people. Speak loudly about what? About him. It's so interesting to me to realize, this came to me while studying the Old Testament, whatever. God does some amazing things, They're kind of scary in the Old Testament. But then I realized, you know, he has no reason to apologize for who he is. And he doesn't back down on who he is. And he follows through on that. And he's very bold about that. Well, of course, he's God. <laughs> he speaks with authority through Jesus. He acts with authority. <laughs> he's God. Wow. So, he didn't have the demon speak, but what did those people learn about him? He was the source of solving their problems. He was the source of dealing with their issues. It was about him. Amazingly, it wasn't about them. This isn't a story about Peter's mother-in-law. It's a story about Jesus lifting her up. This isn't a story about the people who had demons and problems that he healed. It's the fact that Jesus healed them. It's about him. Okay. Turn the page. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. This is how he lived his life. This is what he did. Where was he going? Who was he talking to? He was talking to the Father again, checking in with him. 
And Simon and his companions hunted for him. <laughs> Does that remind you of Joseph and Mary? <laughs> Coming back to the temple, hunting. Where in the world is that kid? And Peter and his companions, where is he? He was sleeping right over there. He's not in the kitchen. He's not up on the roof praying. Where is he? Why were they looking? Well, I bet you all those people were back. There were more of them. He healed many, but I bet you there were more. And they told other friends, and people were getting there, and they all had needs. And they were coming, and they needed him. So they went hunting for him. And when they found him, they said to him, What are you doing here? No, they said, Everyone is searching for you. Kind of the same thing, right? Here you are up here. Everybody needs you. Everybody. Wow. It was urgent. And he answered, Let's go on to the neighboring towns. Wait, 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 wait. Why didn't he say, oh, my, thank you. I forgot. We have appointments. Oh, is this open office time? I didn't realize so many people would be here so early. No. Well, what about those people? It says he wanted to go on to other towns, and it didn't go on talking about them doing that. It doesn't say he went back and healed them. Did he no longer care? Of course he cared. Why did he do what he did? You know, because he didn't come to heal just those people. He came to heal everybody. And to do that, he had a bigger commission, a bigger mission, and more things to do. And by the way, that ties right back to our workshop yesterday. What is the mission God is giving us? We're trying to figure that out. We're trying to discover that. But he has a plan. And that's what we need to dial into. He said, let's go to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. Now, who told him that? Where did he get that idea? Well, he got up early. And he went and was talking to the father. How do you think he talked to the father? What do you think his prayer was like? Suggestion? Oh, Father in heaven, great is your name. May your kingdom come and your will be done. And I am the kingdom come. And I am your will being done. Give us this day everything we need for this day. And help us to forgive no, forgive us and let us forgive all. And Jesus did. When, when they asked Jesus, how should you pray? And he gives that kind of answer. Oh, that's an insight. That's the how he prayed. So what's he up here on the mountain doing? He went up on a lone hill, just like we are, right? And he's praying and what's God doing? He's telling him what I want you to do, where I am sending you because the Father sent him and Jesus sends us. Right. And he says, everyone's searching for you. And they said, no, no, let's go to the neighboring towns. For that's what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their, syn in their synagogues and casting out demons. He went on doing these works, proclaiming the message. What's the message? He's the message. Proclaiming that the kingdom has come. He says, the kingdom is here today. <laughs> Blessed are you because the kingdom is here. And they're going, huh? What are you talking about? Not getting that he is that source. He is that answer. He's not just the one who's going to heal. <laughs> He's the one who's going to heal everything. He's going to heal all their financial troubles. You know, the kingdom is coming not just to resolve some political issues, but he's going to heal both the economy and the ecology. He's going to heal both the sick and even the well, because guess what? We're all broken people in a broken society with broken promises and broken relationships. Why did he do the things he did? This is some of the things I see in here. 
this is just a simple there's a lot of depth in here and i know there's a lot of things i don't get and i don't understand yet but i tell you i'm getting a little more insight and i'm so thankful and i'm so humbled by it and i'm so amazed what is god doing in our lives Sometimes it's just overwhelming and humbling to see what God is doing. I have to tell you a story. And pardon me in advance, but I have to share because you're my church family. And it's not fair for me not to share. But I put things off too. <laughs> Don't we all? And I finally realized I needed to do something about that. So, I needed a new doctor. And I finally got up the courage and chose one and went. And he said, oh, hi, Fred. You're a new patient. We need you to do these new things so that we can get a baseline. So go take, you know, these tests and so forth. And I did. I have to tell you, I think I am very blessed with the doctor I now have. He is just right for me. And I learned from that that sometimes I don't achieve what I need to achieve because I'm missing a relationship in my life. I realize I'm not making progress on that terrible garage of mine because I don't have the right accountability relationship set up to help me make progress. Anybody else have a stamp collection they need to work on or <laughs> something else they're trying to do? That, Boy, but if you had, if you belonged to the right book club, you'd read lots of books. If you had the right friends and coaches, you'd get lots of things done. Okay, and that's just doing things. But what about those areas of our lives where we really need to step up? Do we really have, oh yeah, we're avoiding bad relationships. But do we have the right positive ones we need that would really help us, really help us be children of God? Not just get all the things done on our to-do list, but really, do we have the right Christian relationships to really be the Christians we hope we are, that we want to be, that we pledge ourselves to be? We need the, those relationships to lift the bar and lift us. And I needed a doctor, and I got a good one, and he's wonderful. I'm just so thankful for him. But he had me take these tests, and we began to discover things. The first thing he discovered is, he said, Fred, you have type 2 diabetes. Was I surprised? No. Anybody with type 2 diabetes probably isn't surprised that they finally got a diagnosis. They just avoided it for a long time, right? <sighs> Praise report. After about eight weeks of being more aware and poking yourself in the finger twice a day makes you much more aware being more aware, my index, what's called A1C, has come down two full points. That's good progress. Six weeks? About eight weeks. Eight weeks. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I've got a bit to go, but what does it tell me? That's the right relationship, or the right help. God is helping me. I'm trying to humble myself before him, and we're making progress. Well, I had another problem, too, and I complained to the doctor about it, and he said, ooh. We need to do some other tests. So he sent me for a scan. I won't bore you with the details. But I've now been scanned, you know, more than any, any report going through a fax machine. You know. <laughs> I have been scanned. And what did the scan say? Something I didn't want to hear. It said, you have a bladder tumor. This was not good news. And he said, now I'm sending you to a referral to an, a particular doctor, and he says, I trust him, he's a really good, uh, a good surgeon in this regard. But some would say he could have a little better bedside manner. Now, I think it was really stretching it for my doctor to say that, okay, because they work together, you know, and, you know, but he was giving me a heads up. So I prayed about that. I prayed about that, and I discovered that this surgeon, when I met with him, he, he was a little gruff. You never want to have this happen. And I went to see him, and he said, I don't have good news. That's the worst thing for a doctor to say to you, especially if it's the first thing. 
After a while, I asked him why he did all these clinics and so forth he did, and he says, well, because the, the IRS and my wife both want me to be here. So now every time I see him, I say, how's your wife? He's, we're warming up. We're getting a little. Anyway, so he didn't have good news, and there's this bladder tumor and so forth, and so there was a procedure to try and deal with that. And uh, then we had to wait and see what the pathology report said. And we wait and so forth, and we go in, and the pathology report said, not good news. Not good news. This is not benign. This is the real thing. This is that C word you never want to hear. Well, how did I react? Probably the way all of you might react, or some of you have reacted in time. I, I was very concerned. I was very distraught. And guess where I went? <laughs> to God. And I poured things out, and I poured things out, and I wrestled with things, and I was so concerned about so many things. And there came a certain point when I did something that amazed, even, amazed me. I actually prayed an unselfish prayer. And when I presented my case in an unselfish point, God seemed to say to me, ah, oh, good point, good point. And he seemed to say to me, I got this, Fred. Trust me. What does that mean? What does that mean? So he, Peter goes and he says, these, all these people, all these people, and, and Jesus said, let's go over there. Trust me. Wow. Same thing in a different way for me. Trust me. And then God gave me a sense of peace that I can't even explain. I can't explain. I am not distraught. I am not discouraged. I'm not depressed. I'm not spiraling down. I can read things, even in the medical things or whatever, and you know, read some words and so forth. And, yeah, but I, why? Because I'm here. I'm like Peter's mother-in-law in his hand. Where's he going? I don't know. But he says he's got this. Wow. How are we going to do this? What are we going to do? I don't know, but you know something that my primary physician said? He said, Fred, just deal with one thing at a time. Don't get ahead of yourself. And I began thinking about that and realizing, isn't that a big lesson for all of us in our Christian walk? We all think, oh, I've got to clean the garage. There's this to do and that to do and this to do. Oh, I'm all worried and I'm all stressed. Wait a minute. I've only got today. I don't know if I'm going to live 30 more years. Someone said, live another 70 years, and I said, that won't be any fun. <laughs> if I lived to 140, the only good benefit will be no peer pressure. <laughs> but that, that, that be, that's going to be too hard, right? I don't know how long I have. I only know I have the moment. I have today, and guess what? We're all in that same boat. But I'm in a situation where I suddenly have to be really serious about that. I can't just talk about it and it's nice and funny that I don't know how long I have. Whoa, this has hit me in the face. Wow, but God says he's got this. Now what has God got? What is God doing? I think I remind you last time of this wonderful quote that's been inspiring me from Dallas Worlder. What he said, when you go to God, do you realize who you're dealing with? Do you realize what he has to offer? Do you realize what he's got right there? Unlimited joy. Uh, what is it you're complaining about? And that's what he's holding out? Unlimited joy. I, I can't even take that in. Wow. I, and I'm being serious. I have to stop and think about that. And the more I think about that, and the more I meditate on that, and so forth, I had a situation where I got up during the middle of the night, and you know where your mind's going to go. 
You know how depressed you're going to be. And I went down and sat down and I was sitting there praying or whatever, and I suddenly realized, I'm not afraid. Why am I not afraid? I'm not alone. He is right here. <laughs> That's true for all of us, whether we're sick or not. And by the way, in terms of sick, let me tell you something. <laughs> if they didn't do the scan, I wouldn't know I was sick. So I'm saying, do you have any pain? I don't know. <laughs> Once you hear that this description of things, any little gas bubble could be some awful thing. <laughs> so I can't tell you that I have pain. I can just tell you that I'm me. And here I am. And these scans, and there's been three or four of them, say there's something there. <laughs> so we're going to have to work on dealing with that. But I am not alone. I now know that and see that in a new way. And in seeing that and coming to those moments of incredible peace with him, sitting with him, having him comfort me and having say, I got this, I'll tell you that feeling in that moment is so indescribable. If I could sit in that moment forever, that's where I want to be. That is the place to be, right there with him. Him right there with me and with you and with those people in Capernaum and with Peter and those other, and what they went through in their lives after this point, what they were committing to. <gasps> wow. That's why it's called the New Testament, right? There's all these testimonies in there about what they committed to and how much they committed and they were completely committed and they gave their wives literally to that. And yet what is it? It's a testimony of Jesus it's not just a testimony of Peter and Mark and Paul. and these, It's a testimony of Jesus. And he's saying, come to me. It's all about me. I'm the solution. I am here. I am with you. <laughs> Is he really with us? Is he with me? One morning I got up, I had my now new re-enlivened prayer time and so forth. And, and then I went to work. I'm very, very blessed that I get to work at home almost all the time. It's, it's wonderful. I usually wear a nice shirt. <laughs> and I was thinking, God, you seem really quiet today. Where are you? Where are you? I thought, I'm going to take a little break. Got up from the computer, and I went outside, and I'm walking in the driveway, and just enjoying trying to come to God and talk with God and whatever trying to be alone. But my neighbor down there saw me and he motions me over. And I go over and, how are you doing? I can see he looks pretty pale. I've been saying to God, where are you? My neighbor says, oh, Fred. He says, I just got back from the doctor and I have a bladder tumor. <laughs> where are you, God? His answer, I'm everywhere. Oh, that's unbelievable. I've been very cautious about sharing. Uh, what? Oh, no, stop. stop. <laughs> Someone's trying to teach me Excel at the same time. Anyway, <laughs> sorry about that interruption. Uh, I've been wanting to share this with more and more people. I'm not anxious about this being a secret, but I have to be thoughtful and, and careful and I've been concerned about people at work. So I finally got to the point where I told my boss and he had two interesting reactions. He says, Fred, your health is number one. We will work with anything. The second point, Fred, I don't live very far from you. Let me know what I can do. He's a Christian, huh? No, he's not. He's, hin he's Hindu. Yeah, he's on the way. He's on the way. Where was his heart? What is God doing? I keep asking myself. But he keeps saying, I'm right here. Anyway, I finally, uh, this past week, I wanted to say more to people at the office. And then we had an in-person meeting. And there was one lady that I really have worked with for quite a while. And I wanted to say something. I, was, I said, how are you doing? And she said, oh, Fred, she says, 
I've been diagnosed with a tumor before I could say anything. And she says, now, they've told me that it's not malignant, but they haven't told me that it's benign. It's something between there, and it's something unusual. She says, I've told my coworker, but I haven't told the boss yet. Guess what? She and I have something to talk about now. She, my neighbor and I have something to talk about now. What's God doing? <laughs> He's everywhere. He's amazing. So, putting all these things together, it's one thing at a time and one day at a time. One day at a time. So, I'm privileged with this opportunity to share this with you because I need you as well, and maybe we need each other. Because I'm not the only one with issues and trials and problems and stresses. Not the only one who might face serious illness or, or, or things to keep us back. But we're all in life together, and we all have the opportunity to love each other and to let God love us through each other. So I'm sharing with you. We are disciples. What might be the next steps for all of us? in our church journey, in our personal spiritual journey, in our personal physical journey? What might be the next steps? For me, it turns out, against my will, that my next step is chemo. So Friday, I'll have my first opportunity to learn about that dreadful thing. Okay? And I appreciate your prayers about that. And, yeah, we'll see what happens. That's right. But talking to, you know, I didn't have a doctor, remember? Now I have one, two, three, four, you know. Plus I have a farm D who is calling me, asking and just staying in touch with me about sugar and blood and stuff like this and a separate set of appointments over that. You know, uh, there's, I, now I have this team, and I'm just amazed, and I'm really thankful, and I'm astonished. <laughs> I'm just astonished about it. And uh, the, the one doctor who seemed a little negative and so forth has now referred me to another one, and that one, his approach is slightly different. He says, well, there are some other things. Hey, let's talk about it. He says, but first things first, you need to go through that chemo treatment. We'll talk about this. And he said... But first of all, I didn't even know I had him. I looked, and there, on my, I went online, and I looked at my, whoa, there's an appointment here. Whoa, it's in 15 minutes. <laughs> he reached out to me. He's scheduled with me. Huh? In this day and age? Who's working out these appointments? Who's involved here? And he says, you know, hang in there. Hang in there. We'll deal with this one thing at a time. So we're in things together, and I'll learn some things about chemo in the next few days and weeks. If the treatment is this coming Friday, a pretty big day, then the following Friday, a half day, and the following Friday, nothing. And then we repeat that until... I don't know. When is it? Yeah. Okay, for a little while. Okay, so I'm going to learn some things. And, you know, I may have to wear a hat. Uh, yeah, just joking. i got to have some little fun here, too. Because <laughs> what a journey. If we don't enjoy the journey God's taking us on, how, how what, what? <laughs> you know, not that everything is enjoyable, but I'm not alone. I have him. I have you. We have each other. We have him. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's right. So I'm going forward and stepping in and learning, and I'll keep you posted and updated, and I appreciate, obviously, your prayers and your friendship and so forth. But you will be in my prayers, too, because we're all in life together. And where is it headed? Okay. It's headed towards unspeakable joy. It's headed towards a time of incredible incredible delight and wonderful friendships and no worries. Okay. Yeah. 
I think I told you that story uh, about the the guy pushing the the wheelbarrow across the tightrope, you know, across Niagara Falls. And people came, oh, this is incredible! This guy won Niagara Falls. He comes out with a wheelbarrow, and he, and all these people cheer. You can do it! You can do it! Yeah, it's amazing! And he says, today I'm going to push a wheelbarrow across that line. And, oh, whoa, whoa! And this guy says, yes, yes, yes! And he turns to him and he says, uh, do you think I can do it? And the guy says, yes, I believe you can do it. You're the best. He says, great. You can be the guy to ride in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> so I'm in the wheelbarrow. And I learned several things. One, we get out on that line. It's just as scary as I thought it was going to be. Two, he's God. He can hold me in that wheelbarrow on the top of the line on the side of the line, even upside down on that line, isn't he? He's God. Wow. Three, he never promised we're getting to the other side. He simply said, do you trust me? me? Four, I'm in the wheelbarrow. I'm hanging on. I'm looking around. I'm terrified. And I realize, why aren't I turning around and looking at him? Where's my attention? Should be on him. So I turn around and I look at him. He's not even looking at me. <laughs> Isn't that something? He's got all kinds of things he's doing. He's got me. I'm safe with him. And he's busy. I thought it was all about me. No, it's all about him. Oh, oh. And last lesson, there was no promise that we're going to make it all the way to the other side. There was no promise. It's all about, do you trust me? I have to just get in there and trust him. And we have to do that too. Just like these disciples did back here. And he said, oh, all these people, they're standing at the door, they want you to, and, and he says, we have to move on. Why? Did he not care about those people? No, he cares. But he said, I have to go. This is what I came to do. I came to proclaim the message elsewhere also. He came not just for the people around that neighborhood. He came for the whole world. He didn't just come just for you and me in this congregation. He came for all of them. He came for the whole world. And he is here for the whole world. And he is using us as part of that. No, not just using us, living in us for that. And we have to take our next steps one day at a time and giving each day to him. That's where we're at. That's what we're doing. I'll try and keep you posted, but I bet you you have things you could post and tell me too. How's it going for you? Where is he in your life? Has he got you in the palm of his hand? Of course he does. Can he be trusted? Of course he can. Okay. Does he have a good sense of humor? Yes. Does he have an unbelievable sense of other things? Yes, he's got. He's greater, bigger. We can't contain him. We can't even fully understand him. Okay. So, is it real? Is this really happening? Man, and I discuss this every day. What, what's, how do we get into this? What, is this really happening? Well, Jesus' faith was really real. And what God is doing is really real. And he's moving everywhere and moving forward. And as the scripture says here that Peter came to him and said, everybody is searching for you. You know, they all are. But some of them don't know that he's the answer. They don't know that's who he's searching for. But we're all searching for him too. He says, come on, get in the wheelbarrow. In the wheelbarrow, let's go. So we go. So what's God doing? He is everywhere, and he is moving forward. Let's go with him. Amen. Amen. So we turn to this little symbol here about being with him, putting our hands in his hands, about his, him leading us forward. And... You know, this bread that we start with here, <laughs> the, 
the manna. I was just reading about the manna in the desert. They got a nice breakfast every day that week, right? Every day for 40 years. That leaped off of the page of me. For 40 years. Every day. They got the manna every day. Whoa. <laughs> he is with them and he is with us. And who is the manna from heaven? It's Jesus. He's the one. He's the real thing. Yeah. Yep. So let's take this together and remember him and think about him and think what he's doing. Let's pray. Father, a great and wonderful God, as you feed us every day, we acknowledge you. Let us proclaim your name and your greatness and your will. Let us receive of your daily feeding and your daily care and the daily dose of Jesus that we need, your daily forgiveness, your daily help, your daily faith, and everything for us. We thank you and we ask you to help us take that in, to fellowship with you, to stay with you, and, and to lead us forward in every day. In Jesus' name. Let's take this bread and realize that Jesus' faith was real. His faith was real. And he says, take, eat of me, and take my faith and my life into yours. And he, he said, when they arrested Jesus, they, <laughs> Peter got all excited. And you remember he cut off the servant's ear? And Jesus said, wait, wait, just stop. Don't you realize I have to drink the cup my father gave me? That cup of suffering, that cup of tremendous challenge. We all have our challenges, right? We've, he had the most incredible challenge, and he insisted on taking that cup. And he gives us this cup, his sacrifice, his blood, his care, his atone, his forgiveness. To him be glory. And so I had to tell you, and I had to give you an update. But more importantly than that, I needed to share the scripture because I think there's a lot that's in it. There's much more here than I see. There's more than meets the eye. To God be the glory for all of that. Thank you, brothers and sisters. <laughs>